So this morning, i like to remind you once again, because the Bible is full of reminders, and if you get fed up of reminders, Hebrew says you become dull of hearing. And when you become dull of hearing, you start to doubt, or drift rather. And when you start to drift, you start to doubt. And when you start to doubt, you start to disappear. When you disappear, you're damaged. And when you're damaged, you lead, it leads to destruction. So, I can have all the D's in the world, but yet it's never enough to hear the Word of God. Now, this year we we're talking about moving forward and, you know, building up what we have in God and sharpening what God has given to you. How many of you know that God has given each one of us a talent, a gift? Some people have not found out that gift yet. They're probably 60 years old, but they haven't found that gift yet. <coughs> I want to encourage you this morning, try and find what God has given to you. And when you find that gift, don't hide it. Don't keep it under lock and key, just because you might lose it. You've got to sharpen it, you've got to use it. When you don't use a knife, for long, what happens? It becomes blunt. You've got to use it. You've got to sharpen it as you use it. So it's always sharp. That's our Christian life. We've got to keep our lives, Christian lives sharp at all times. So much so that when we carry the sword of the Spirit, it can pierce through anything, any challenge, any obstacle, any hindrance. So let's sharpen our lives. Let's sharpen our gifts. Let's sharpen our talents that God has given to us. Because if we do that this year, we can move forward for the glory of God even more. Amen. You might be doing things that you never did in your life before. And you were wondering, was that me? Surprise to yourself and all, because God has done it through you. So there's a lot of things that we can look at. So find out what the talent that God has given to you and try and use it for the glory of God. And not only using it, now sometimes, you know, things can become forgotten. And when, when you don't use what you have, it tends to get blunt and finally you lose it. So here in 2 Timothy, Paul warns Timothy. It's a great, a great encouragement, a great reminder. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, I want to share verse 6, verse 12, verse 13, and 14, and 15. Okay? I'm not going to share the whole chapter, by the way. Therefore, I remind you, this is a reminder. Now, not only to Timothy, it's for all of us. Therefore, I remind you stir, to stir up the gift of God. To stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, Paul has said Timothy in Ephesus and said, here, you look after this church. But I remind you, there are a lot of oppositions, there's a lot of falsehood that are going around. So you need to have that gift of God within you, sharpen at all times, so that you can fight all these situations. That's in layman's term. Paul actually encouraging Timothy. Paul is encouraging us today in our churches, in our society, in our dealing with the world. I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, the gift in Greek here is charisma. Given to Timothy is compared to a fire. 
If you look at 1 Thessalonians 5.19, what did Paul say? Quench not your spirit. Don't extinguish what's within you. Because sometimes we do. You know, we tend to drift away a little bit. And then whatever we have dies a little bit or fades away. And we're not reminded, we're not, we don't have that inspiration anymore. I've often heard people say, well, I have become dry. My well has become dry. That's not a good place to be in. If a well is dry, what good is it to anyone? There's no water in it. So our lives shouldn't go dry. It should be fresh and it should be sharpened all the time so that it'll do other people good too. Our wells should be filled with water so that many can drink from it too. Stir up the gift of God. It's compared to fire in Thessalonians that he must stir or fan. You know, when we have barbies and all that sort of stuff, the fire dies down, the cold charcoal with some ashes on it, you start fanning it again. So the flames come up. That's exactly what Paul meant, to flame what we have, to fan what we have so that our flames don't die down, so that our inspiration, our motivation to serve God and to be with God and work with God and work with His church will not die down. If my, if my flame has died down, I wouldn't be here this morning. If I were in my flesh, this morning I thought, I don't want to go to church this morning. Lord, because I don't have a message, specific message for the church. This whole week has grabbed hold of me and took all my time, so much so that I can't get down and pray and start searching the Word of God to give to the church of God. So I thought to myself in the flesh, I'm going to call him sick. I am sick, by the way. But I didn't call him. I conquered my fleshly desires, my weakness, by stirring up my flame this morning to be inspired by God to bring a message to the church. I thought about it. I said, wow, it'd be so nice. It's snowing out there. It's so cold. I'm under my duvet with 21 degrees. So nice and warm. I thought, I can call him sick. There's enough people here to minister the word of God. Why should I be there? I could have given up easily. But you know... God says, Holy Spirit says, here's your fan, man. Start fanning that flame so that it'll come up and inspire and go. It start burning. So Timothy here is encouraged by Paul to stir or fan into flames once again. The gift was probably a special gift and power from the Holy Spirit to fulfill his ministry, rather. You see, in ministry, the Spirit of God is so important. You can't neglect that at all. You can't neglect the gift that is in you either. Who said we don't need the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You know, all these ministers, they say, we don't need it. We have this, the sealing of the Spirit of God. We have the Word of God. We, we have been trained in a college for three years. You know what? Training in a college, having a degree or, or anything does not make you what you are in God. It's the Spirit of God that makes you who you are in God. It's so important. Ministers today need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, led by the Spirit of God, studying the Word of God, meditating upon it, revealing things by the Spirit is what matters more in our lives in order to minister and impart the true Word of God. To God's people. And this is Paul's heart exactly. Telling Timothy. Yes, God has given him a special gift of power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill the ministry. And yet sometimes we can fall short and fall slacken. Because of what goes on in our world. We are merely human beings anyway. 
We fall, we fail. But here Paul encourages us, don't let that failure overtake you. If you don't have any friends, I'll buy you one. Start fanning that gift that God has given to you so that the flame will never die down. Your barbecue will cook better. Note that the gifts and powers given to us by the Holy Spirit do not, I repeat, do not automatically remain strong and vital. Yes, I've been baptized by the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Spirit that lives within me. How cannot become strong and vital in my life? It's because you are there. There's nothing wrong with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is a gentleman too. He won't force you. He won't twist your arm and make you do things. That's why we can't turn around and say God's not fair. He's absolutely just and absolutely fair. Church, we need that flame burning continuously. I can sing. I've got talent from God. I can play an instrument. Great. What does even the world says? Practice makes perfect. We need to keep sharpening what God has given to us. Not just sing one song, I've, I've, I've made it. We've got to keep going, keep singing, keep composing. <coughs> singing in the Lord, unto the Lord. Stirring up the gift of God using a big fan. Flame the fire. Church is not automatically remain strong and vital. They must be fueled by the grace of God through our prayers, through our faith, through our obedience and diligence. And that's what it takes. Exercising, practicing all the time. What do we come to do? We come to exercise our godly given talents in the midst of of God's people with Jesus walking through the lampstand, his church. So he hears, he knows, he's pleased, and I would love to please him at all costs. So should you. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Look at Timothy's life after that. He is so diligent and faithful and loyal and committed to what God has called him to do. How God has led him by the Spirit of God. Teaching him and revealing things to him so that he can impart the ministry of God to the church that he was entrusted with. The next verse says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Church, when we are baptized by the Spirit of God, we don't fear anything but God. We have that power and we have that love that is placed within our hearts and lives and our mind is sound because we are wearing Christ all the time. Put on Christ. Paul says, sometimes we put on Christ. When it gets too hot, we take it off. That's when our flames die. We shouldn't be doing that. If we put on Christ, it's for life. People like to say, isn't it? A dog is not for Christmas, it's for life. I will change that. Jesus is for life. And Paul continues, probably in prison, he says, For this reason I also suffer, verse 12, For this reason I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. He's encouraging Timothy here. Look at my life. Look at the missionary journeys. Look at the sufferings that I've been through. Look at the people that try to oppose me and kill me. But yet I am not ashamed of the gospel, because I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. 
It's an amazing testimony. When you look at Paul's life, oh, when, we, when we kick a stone, oh, it hurts. When we, when we hit a little, little small wall in our ministry, oh, it hurts. I don't want to carry on. It's embarrassing. How many of us have got to that place and given up? A lot of people I've seen has given up because it hurts. Well, they should read this passage. They should look at all the missionary journeys of Paul. How he was committed. To keep that which I have committed, Paul said. Paul does not define that which he has committed unto God. It may refer to his apostolic work, or teaching, or even his life. What have you committed this morning? Your service, your talent, your life? What is it? It's important that we know the seriousness of having Jesus in our lives and serving Him. If you go and work in a company and you've got to be at work for 9, you'd rather get there for 8.30 just in case you get sacked. That's serious, isn't it? Because you're taking your work seriously. How come Christians don't come to church at for 10.30 when Jesus is waiting for them? Because they don't treat it as serious as going to work. That's the difference. What's the difference, really? It's more important because we come to meet our Savior. We come to praise Him and thank Him. If we can get to work for 8.30, why can't we get to church for 10.15? I'm lenient here. You know, back home, I have to say this. The church begins at 9.15. And the people are there from 8.30. There are 1,500 people fill in that church. By 9 o'clock, everybody's quiet, ready to, for the service to start. If you go to India, one hour before, they at the church, praising, singing. I arrive about 9 o'clock, and the meeting starts about 9 something. And the people are there from 8, 8.30. Amazing. I was so encouraged when I saw this. Why can't we have it back home? That was my thought. But no... We look at our watches in the morning. Hey, it's still 10 o'clock. It's only 10 o'clock. Still got half an hour. But never think about any kind of hazards that you can face, like traffic, like accident on the road that will delay you. We don't think like that here. Church, we need to encourage ourselves and build ourselves up. This Sunday is the most important time, day of our life. The Sabbath. Keep it holy. Keep it special. Prioritize our lives. And you know what? If you start doing that, God's going to bless you, bless you tremendously. He is. And I'm not saying that lightly. Because I have actually experienced the blessing of God in my life when I was loyal and faithful to his service. I'm encouraging you, church. I'm not telling you, I'm encouraging you. If we can do that, hey, God will be well pleased. Look at my children. They prioritize me first in their lives. I can't but help open the windows of heaven and pour out the showers of blessing that they can't contain. Read Malachi. You know, if we start exercising God seriously, God's going to be serious with us too. Not that He doesn't want to be serious. It's a covenant. It's a covenant. God's waiting for you to stir yourself up, to build yourself up, to encourage yourself up. And I'm going to be there at church for 10 o'clock. Don't talk about 10, 15, Richard. I'm going to be there for 10. I'm going to start praying when I arrive. 
that God's will will be done and God will be glorified in the church. Wouldn't that be nice if everybody comes at 10 and start praying before the meeting starts? Because our concentration is on God. Forget about ourselves, the song says, and concentrate on the Lord that we come to worship. If we start doing that, you know what? God's going to add to this church daily. Don't believe me? Try it. Paul was committed because he was persuaded that God is able to keep what he has committed until the day. Great stuff. Until that day when he takes him home. Verse 13 says, Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Hold fast. Hebrews talks about hold fast. Paul talks about hold fast. It's important when the Bible repeats and reminds us what are we to hold fast? The pattern of of sound words. A lot of people heard Paul. A lot of them heard Paul in his missionary journeys. A lot of Christians and non-Christians heard Paul. But you know what? Just like Jesus' day, thousands followed him. But when he was crucified, they all ran away. Here, Paul faced the same situation. They abandoned me. In Asia. So Paul is actually encouraging Timothy. Hold fast. Don't give up. Don't abandon. The pattern of sound words. Which we heard from me. In faith. And love. Which are in Christ Jesus. The sound words are the original. And fundamental revelation of Jesus Christ. And the apostles. The doctrines taught to Timothy by Paul, not man's opinions. Today, man's opinions rule. I'm going to share it tonight. If you want to hear it, the church of Ephesus, Nicolaitans, okay? Man's opinions actually don't count today. But you know what? Man's opinions and rules sound good because the devil has twisted their little ears to be itchy so that any minister of Satan can tickle their ears. So the sound doctrines flown out of the window. We must hold these truths fast in faith and love toward Jesus Christ until that day. And we've got to be persuaded and be committed. Because he, Jesus, is able to keep us. Jesus don't want to force you if you don't want to be kept. That's the whole story. You know, God's a gentleman. He won't force you to do things. Then we have a cheek and turn around and say, God, why don't you remind me? So many reminders in the scriptures. That's God's reminding us. Never ever depart from the fundamental truths of God's word. And not compromise them even if it means suffering, rejection and disgrace. You know, this is the commitment that Paul had made. Even though he was suffering. On the second missionary journey, he could have said, God, I've had enough. Take me home. Or, I don't want to do this anymore. Can I transfer it to somebody else? Paul never questioned God. You know, at times, legitimately, he could have said to God, God, is that what you call me for? My life has been sought after. I've been stoned to death and dragged out of the city. Left me to die. 
I've been in prison so many times, I can't even, can't even count them. You sent me on a boat, and my ship got wrecked. And not only that, a snake bit me. Is that what you call me for? Legitimately, he could ask God, but he never questioned God. Even though all these sufferings and rejection and disgrace happened to him, he held fast to him who was able to keep him, who is Jesus. Amazing testimony. Church, we've not been through one-third or one-tenth of what Paul has been through. And here we're complaining, we're moaning, we're grumbling. Why do we have to be at every service? <laughs> Why? Well, I don't tell you to come to every service, but I encourage you to come to every service because the blessing of God is in every service. If you don't want to be blessed, fine. Now, I'm not knocking other people who circumstantial situations. I'm encouraging. I'm not knocking. I'm not telling. I'm encouraging. If that's the body of Christ, look at Antioch Church. They broke bread from house to house daily. Not weekly, daily. Such commitment. And when God saw that commitment, his heart broke. Add many more people to this group because I'm well pleased with them. Church, this is church life that God requires. God intended this kind of church. But the church throughout centuries has gone down so far off the mark, it's unbelievable. Why? Because they did not stir the gift that is within them. It tended to fade. It tended to die. Opinions crept in. Satan infiltrations came in and drove all the whole fast truth of fundamentals out of the way and brought in men's opinions. You've got to do this at a certain time. You've got to sing this at a certain time. You've got to play this at a certain time. You've got to wear this at a certain time. What to do? Go back to basic. Search your scriptures. Paul is encouraging Timothy, don't jump on the bandwagon of falsehood. Even if you're on your own, Stand with God. So, we need to hold fast. You know, all the fundamental truths of God's word, what Paul is teaching, what Jesus is teaching, even when it means suffering and rejection and disgrace. Today, it is popular in some churches to emphasize that experience, not doctrine, is the most important thing. You know, we, 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 we've heard, I, I, I've been to churches, I don't know about you, that major on experiences, not on doctrine. Oh, I have this experience with the Lord. It was so warm. It came over me. The anointing of God. And what did you do? I had nothing. <laughs> I was just enjoying it. You know, if that is the case, if God really wants you to do something, you ha he'll tell you what to do, not just to enjoy the warmth. Probably he was in the sun. <laughs> I tell you, they major on experiences, not on doctrine. It's very popular now. But this is firmly contradicted in Paul's epistles. Because in 1 Timothy... 6, it says this, 3, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud knowing nothing. So if you have all the opinions of men, which sounds very familiar, what is the word says? He is proud knowing nothing. 
but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil, suspicions. You see, church, the Bible warns us and encourages us time after time that we need to hold fast to Jesus' teaching and the Apostles' doctrines. No, nothing else. Nothing else. To be honest, I wouldn't read somebody else's opinion. Really. I would rather read the Scriptures and expound from the Scriptures what I understand. It's dangerous. There's a danger to it. If you're reading something that sounds very similar but false, if you didn't know it, then you take on board somebody's reading and you run with it. And that can lead you somewhere else. So I have learned throughout the years, don't get me wrong, I have learned throughout the years to stick on the Word of God. Amen. And I do further study with cross-references and concordance that I have because concordance is good. And then commentaries who are people who have sought the Lord all through their lives and studied the Bible all through their lives so much so that it's done for us. And when you read a commentary even if it doesn't base on scripture don't take it. That's how serious it is. So all my life I read the scriptures I read commentaries I look at concordances and whatever I understand is what I'm imparting. If my understanding is wrong, the Spirit of God will tell me. Whatever I have to say and impart has to be based on Scripture only. Then you have the sound Word of God. Nothing added, nothing subtracted. Just imparting in, in a layman's term of my understanding of what God is saying. So, these churches who experience who emphasize experience and not doctrine, Paul contradicts all of that. Because in 2 Timothy 4, 3, it says, For time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. This is the time, church. This is the time. I've heard it all. I've heard it for 10 years. I've switched off now. Novelty is better. A new thing that comes in. It sounds better. No, Paul says, they will not endure, but according to their own desires, because they have itchy ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And boy, there's so many teachers that's been heaped up for them to hear what they want to hear. And you know what? They are filled with thousands and thousands of people. Probably millions of ears now that have been scratched, if you like, to ease the itch. Church, now is the time. We've got to understand. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. 14. That good thing which was committed to you keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. So whoever says Holy Spirit is not important, then they, they don't know the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit is the one, our teacher, our guide, who will help us to understand and to hold fast and give us the strength to continue our walk in Jesus. And not to be persuaded by any falsehood or deception. Keep by the Holy Spirit. We must guard and defend the gospel committed to us even in a day when many depart from the New Testament faith. I didn't say many will depart. The Bible says it. If you read Timothy, Thessalonians, all of it, they will tell you in these last days, perilous times, in the last days, evil spirits, seducing spirits will deceive you and keep on deceiving. So we must guard and defend the gospel, the sound doctrine which we hold fast, right to the end, even though Many are falling away from their faith. Church pastors, leaders have a stronger responsibility to see that the truth of God's word 
is sound and found in the church of Jesus Christ. That's why James says, don't be hasty to become teachers. There's a stricter judgment. Just because it, look good, it looks good, don't envy. Don't be hasty to become one unless God has called you, unless you've studied all through the years. And we can only do that through the strength and power of the Holy Spirit. Who is our teacher, by the way. So important to be baptized by the Holy Spirit today. So much so that the Spirit of God can help us and remind us to pick up our fans and start flaming, fanning the fire so the flames will start coming up. Church is high time. If you want to go forward this year, if you want to do something great for the Lord Jesus in His church, to see people coming into His kingdom, Start using that fan again. Fifteen, this you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me. Among who are phygelous, fi fi oh, whatever, and hom homogenes. <laughs> Manchester and Piccadilly, okay. All turn away from me. You know, they've been stirred up once. Can you not see that? These guys that worked with Paul, walked with Paul, ministered with Paul, they were all stirred up. And now, where's that stir gone? Where's that flame gone? They have abandoned me. It's a sad times in Paul's life. He's in prison. In Rome with no hope of freedom. He sees the gospel for which he has given his life. Undergoing persecution and desertion and at Rome. This is what has happened to him. It, it probably break his heart. To see the people that are close to him. Walk away and fade away. No wonder the scripture reminds us over and over and over again. You know, in chapter 4, verse 6, it says this, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. It's amazing, isn't it, when, when you finish and accomplish and achieve what God has called you to do all through the years, sold out for God, suffered for God, rejected for God, and now your close ones abandon you, if Paul felt the same thing, how would Jesus feel on the cross? When everybody abandoned him. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You know, Paul understood everything. I was the last to saw Jesus. I am the least of the apostles. But you know what? His rewards in heaven are galore. All turn away from me. Deserted. Many turn away from Jesus too, like I said. Many are turning away from the truth of the gospel today, like Paul says. But you know what, church? Some are turning away from the church too. It's very subtle. The enemy is very subtle in trying to keep you not coming to Jesus and not exercising godly exercises. He's very subtle. And you know what, if you've not been for a while to a meeting, you get numb. And you don't bother to get, pick up yourself and go back because it looks embarrassing. I've not been for a while. That's the enemy, the lie from the enemy that keeps you away. Why should you feel embarrassed? I've not been for 10 weeks. If I go now, what will they think? See, that's the enemy working on your mind. 
But nobody will ever think, even you, not been for a year, when you come back, just like the prodigal son, with arms open, welcome back. But the devil likes to keep you away very subtly with a lot of excuses sometimes. But church, never let that grip or grab hold of you and say, if you've not been for two weeks, three weeks, it doesn't matter. In the fifth week you come back, praise the Lord, and the church will welcome you. People are turning away from the church too, not only from the faith, but from the church. You know what? When God sees that, it saddens his heart. It's becoming like the Bible says in the gospel, as in the days of Noah too. We are all witnessing these things. In the days of Noah, we go out there, preach the gospel. Noah preached for 120 years. There's a flood coming. Ha, ha, ha. For 120 years they mocked. And they made fun of Noah. But Noah was faithful. And when the time came, that's it. God shut the door. These are the days we live in. Just like in the days of Noah. People are marrying. Having a great time. Lovers of themselves. Boasters. Haughty. Headstrong. Lovers of money than lovers, rather than lovers of God. This is what's going on. Just like in the days of Noah. We see these things happening. But church, when these things happen, we should be encouraged more. Because these are the signs of times. I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed unto him until that day. That's what we've got to hold on to. He is also experiencing, experiencing such a staggering defection from him and his gospel in the East that he states that everyone in Asia has turned away from him. What a feeling. Paul was suffering. In, in chapter 4, 16, it says, at my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's Jesus' prayer. Paul here, same. Please don't charge them. Such love. In Titus 1.14, it says, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. You know, church, Paul's letters always reminds us that we need to hold fast and not let go to the sound pattern of God's word. Yet in this terrible suffering, going back to his suffering, trial and suffering of an apostasy, by the way, Paul maintains his faith in God. He is assured that Jesus Christ will guard the true gospel and its ministry. Two Timothy one twelve says this: For this reason, I also suffer these things. You know, he suffered that there will always be people such as Timothy who will keep and proclaim, and that at his death, the Lord will bring him safely. Now he he was assured. When he encouraged Timothy, he trusted Timothy as a son. He loved him and he knew that Timothy will continue with the gospel that is committed to him. So now he can go home with full assurance that the good work is going to be carried on. This is needed in every church. You know, the work in this church should be carried on when I go. There has to be somebody who carries the torch and run with it just like Timothy does or did. That's Paul's heart. That's the heart of the Lord Jesus too. That his church will continue to grow and not abandon the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, this sorrowful plight of Paul will be the experience of many of the faithful in the last days before the end. We will have that experience 
We will have that sorrow. We will see all these things happening. Those loyal to the New Testament gospel will suffer similar grief as they see many abandon the true biblical faith. And as they find their ministries rejected by those seeking to be in harmony with the prevailing spirit of this evil age. That's why, you know, when we see thousands flocking to a church, people think immediately, logically, there must be something going on, something that's right, because thousands are flocking to it. Not necessarily. <coughs> Not necessarily. Because these kind of ministry, holding fast and telling people not to forsake and, and preaching that people should be on a narrow road, this kind of ministry will be rejected. Will be rejected. And those are seeking to be in harmony with the prevailing spirit of this evil age. They will reject what we do. They will reject what we say. It's nothing personal. It's a spiritual matter. That this antichrist, the spirit of antichrist has been prevailing for so long. And yet the man has not been revealed yet. But it's going to be revealed. As was happening to Paul, many will turn away from the true child of God who remains loyal to the New Testament gospel. So if anyone comes up to you and offend you or reject what you're saying, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Praise the Lord. What I'm saying is affecting. Church, I would like to encourage you, as Paul has encouraged Timothy this morning, don't forget your fans. Start fanning that flame that has died down so that the flame will rise again. Inspiration will rise again. Motivation will rise again. And our commitment will rise so much so that we are persuaded that he is able to keep us right to the end. Amen? Amen. Amen. So be encouraged. Let's exercise what Paul is teaching us and encouraging us. Start flaming Start fanning, start stirring, so that we want God more in our lives. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.